speaking to water at 602 Strapper time. Mr. Mel Monahan is not here today. I will be chairing the meeting. Uh, Debbie? Here. Gary? Yes. Having a quorum, we'll proceed with the meeting. Action items, financial business. We already did the, did the manifest, so they should be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd entertain a motion for the approval of school board minutes from 124 public and non public. So moved. Do I hear a second? Just say that we'll have a discussion. Okay, yeah. So moved. You second anything? Yes. All right, I'm sorry. I have some corrections. Amanda, I know there was so much. I mean, Amelia, I know there was so much for you to do, but you did a nice job. On page four, on line forty-one. Okay. Okay. Instead of saying the state is not funding as many programs as before, it was the state adequacy grant. Oh my goodness, this is annoying. Uh, hold on one second. The state ad adequacy grant fund funding has decreased. I'm sorry. Okay. I have too many children. Okay. Um, now on page five. Okay. Line 74, uh -huh. after vote, okay. it's a, it should be, even if the Strafford Board voted to approve the refunding of the fund balance, it would have to be a majority vote for us to get the money back. So a majority vote based on the joint board? On, on the, the joint Strafford. board, okay. right. Okay, and line 75. Um, the fund balance, the SAU fund balance, instead of 200017 it is $474,000. Then on page 6, on line 94, at the end of that sentence, it should say, um, wait a minute, let me just see if I can word that. Uh, Ms. Hendrickson said the amount estimated to be $100,000 is money to cover the expense without, it should be the expense within the capital reserve account without asking the town for additional funds. <coughs> Line 168, okay. that was not correct. Um, it should read, instead of remove the assistant principal position, it should be to create a hybrid position, which would be a, an assistant principal with guidance background. That was what the point that was brought up not to remove the position, to create a hybrid position. Okay, okay and line 182. The board members Um, we voted to remove the part-time guidance counselor position, oh, okay. not the, the fifth grade. grade teaching position. Um, I think that's all I saw, but it's a good job. Really. 
I just have one. You have one? Okay. One small page, there. please. Um, just on page six, line 97. 97? Yeah. Okay. All right. The current equipment is resi residential tanks. It's um, boilers. Those four boilers are residential. Oh, the residential boilers, not residential tanks? Right. Okay. right. It's not a real big deal, but just so there's no confusion. Yeah. And also on 183, um, Debbie found the one I also had on 183. Mm -hmm. Not a great feature. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Okay. okay. No other changes. All those in favor of approving with the changes? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, business administrator's report. Good evening. My report begins on page 14 with the memo telling you what is enclosed in your financial reports. This month you have the revenue report and your expenditure report as of February 21st, 2018. Your packets are a little thinner now that we're not putting in a 26-page budget <laughs> every meeting. Um, with that being said, there were a couple of things that I did want to talk to the board about. Um, it's been brought up at the joint board about returning the surplus of the preschool fund balance. Um, I don't, I forgot to bring those figures with me, but I think for Stratford it's somewhere around $20,000. So, Marjorie, when would that money, would that money be actually turned back to the, to the district or would it be offset what we would be paying next year? Nope, you've asked for it, you've asked for it for this year, so okay. it will be returned back this fiscal year as unanticipated revenue, so it will be... It will be extra revenue this year was, was it for your next year's tax rate. Right. Was it 100000 total? It was about $100,000 total. So I had to go back and figure out, because you have to understand, for a while it was a third, a third, a third. So when I previously gave back the amount, I want to say it was maybe 172 that we returned back to the town, that was split back at a third, a third, a third. Since then, so I made a clean cut right there, mm -hmm. because then after that, it rate rationed out to about 40, 40, 20. So it's pretty much been the split is 40, 40, 20, 40, Nottingham, 40, Northwood, 20, Stratford. And that's based on the number of students we send to the preschool. Correct. Mm -hmm. With a rolling three year average. Right. We just all pay a yep. third of the rent yep. and the utility. Uh, utilities are included in the rent. Um, Debbie had asked at the joint board meeting last Monday about the invoice for the cafeteria. There was one that was going through the cafeteria and there was one for the repairs that were going through the building. Um, I looked at those, you are correct. In my eyes, they should be going towards the cafeteria. That's how we handle all the other school districts. Mm -hmm. um, so we did make that change and I did contact Eric to let him know because it was like a freezer repair and then I think the other one was dishwasher. Like a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's like two arguments on that. Is it a part of the building? Yes. But do we have a cafeteria fund? Yes. So in my eyes, it actually should be going towards the cafeteria fund because if all else fails, you don't have the cafeteria. Are you still going to have to, you know what I mean? If you're not having to pay to keep the upkeep because there's no cafeteria. Then. And the money from the cafeteria can't be put into the general fund. <laughs> right. So it's best to use all that money up. Right because we can't turn that money back to the town. Right. It just sits there. Yeah. What what it was is when we had to sign the manifest the other night, there were two invoices from basically the same vendor. I think it was almost the same day or around the same time period. And they one was for the dishwasher and one was for repairing the stove. So it's like one was in the general fund and one was in the cafeteria fund. So. It's interesting that the money comes out of the general fund as voted on by the taxpayers, but can't go back to is not able to go back into the general yeah. fund. Yeah. But if it's a deficit, yeah. the yeah. general fund has to cover it. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So it's one of those things where I've talked with Eric about it because um, you have, you can turn it back, but you have to keep so much money there. Like you have to keep like one third of your expenses of the budget in that amount, and you guys fall within that. Um, other than that, you would probably have to turn it back. So one of the things that the state has said, you know, use that money for repairs, replacement of equipment and stuff like that, slowly. So that, you know, which is great because it'll keep our cafeteria up and functioning, you know, and on top of technology or whatever equipment that they need. So it's best from here on in to make sure that we, that money comes out of the cafeteria. Yep. Okay. Thank you for looking at that. You're welcome. Um, 
on page 15 um, is your revenues. Um, I've reported back to you previously about change. Um, we were having discussions at the SAU with the individual treasurers about changing banks and everything like that. Um, everybody has since changed except for Stratford School to TD Bank, and one of the reasons for that was it was to get more interest out of the bank account. However, I think um, to a point, I think TD uh, citizens, we're all with TD. I think citizens now was kind of like a little scared that um, we'd be pulling the business out of here too. So if you'll see, typically we only budget about $100 for interest. Typically you get five, ten dollars a month. Um, to date, you're already twelve hundred dollars, and that's through January that you're receiving now through interest. Okay. So hopefully we'll keep seeing that increase through the end of the year, and hopefully in future years, maybe. <laughs> um, your rental income, um, you're about thirty-five hundred dollars short right now. Your adequate education aid and your school building aid are still set to come in. Um, your Medicaid rates. There has been a change in the Medicaid company, uh, MSB, which is who we use, is was kind of bought out. Um, so that we're that they're like kind of two months behind between the switchover and trying to get caught up on all the claims and the payments and everything. And we have a meeting with them on March 9th to work on our relationship moving forward with all the school districts. What's their rate? What's their rate? I don't, I think that's one of the things that we'll be meeting on. I don't know if it's saying, I don't know if you know if it's saying that right too bad. And then there's your um, food service. So today we're, you know, we're kind of even as to what we've reported and amount remaining, which we're halfway through the year, which is good to see. Any questions on the revenues? Okay. Your expenses are now being reported landscape because now we're trying to figure out, anticipate certain items that we don't have a purchase order for or um, your substitutes and everything like that. So now it's a longer report. Um, so you can see as we're going through that we're anticipating substitute salaries and the FICA and the retirement because you have a sick day reimbursement that's going to be coming out now with the retirement. So that's going to increase your FICA in New Hampshire retirement as well. That would be worst case scenario. Page two, you can see that there are certain things that we know that we're in the process of getting, but we do not have purchase orders in place yet. We're getting into the spring co-curriculars and extracurriculars, so hopefully we should be seeing those encumbered by next month, I would think. Question on page two, Marjorie. Yep. The computer technology equipment. Why do we have money left? Why are you anticipating a lot of money left? Isn't that following our technology plan? I mean, didn't we budget a certain amount because we were going to spend that money? You're on the computer technology equipment line, 5734000, that's because we've worked with Scott, so there's a savings in that line because we had to overexpend another computer line okay. down, the, down further. Yeah. Okay. okay. That was one question I so did have for him during our financial meeting, okay. um, so and that's what we've discussed. So you'll see that in a page or two. <clears throat> Page three is your special education, and like I said, going into co-curricular and extracurricular that we've anticipated. Page four at this point, we don't know who the environmental school chaperones are, so we're anticipating those for now. Those stipends are already uh, so Right, yep. but we have this meeting yes. a yep. week right. and a half yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes a little time to get caught up. Page two. Yep. Substitute paraprofessional salaries. Why are we so over? I could talk to you about that problem in another public session. Okay. That's quite a bit. And that's why you can see I've estimated, like I knew we were already over, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to figure out how much more before we get to
So continuing on to page four, to um, it finalizes your athletics and your truant officer. Page five is I'm your. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'm behind. On page three, was your what? What about the enrichment? Why is the enrichment not being used? That line. It's the co-curricular. We've used it. I don't know. I don't. I don't have a, if I don't have a stipend form for it, and I I'm not aware. Yeah, those are for the. Those are. I think those are for stipends. So the enrichment. Yeah. Because there's enrichment and then there's enrichment supplies. Okay. So, so the supplies are for the kinds of things that the programs need. And those, both of those lines are typically for stipends. But I think her question is why aren't they anticipated? Yeah. Why aren't we using anticipated? Um, I, I'm not sure I can look at it. Um, Do you not want to do that? Do you just want me to go to the bottom line? Well, it, we, we, we each board each board is different, so because it's still really too early to tell them we're a long way off till June 30th. I think it is. I agree. Um, that's what you guys have to do through. every month. So <laughs> well, you, we usually go through the highlights if there's big. If there's highlights, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's a number that seems odd, we mm -hmm. usually question that. Numbers to really. I know. the last page. At this point. Okay. 172,000. Yeah. 171,000. Yeah. How firm is that being? Um, I think it may change by 10 to 20,000 up or down before the end of the year. Okay. Um, we might be able to release some electricity. We might be able to release some fuel oil. I mean, items like that. I don't know where we're going to be with the substitutes at the end of the year. There's quite a bit encumbered for that. So, <laughs> no more snow for the rest of the year. <laughs> now, how come our rentals are down so much from 3,500? Um, on the anticipated revenues. That I'm not sure. I know you guys typically do a lot of rec stuff in there, and we receive payments for that for um, men's basketball. Mm -hmm. and, um, I can look into that at the office. Compare it from prior years as to mm -hmm. what we've tonight. It may be one of those things where you see more in the spring than any other time. Marjorie, in the insurance premium, um, are, does our insurance premium go down $7,000? Which insurance premium? Like our building? Line? Building and content? Yes. It it okay. And that's reflected in our new budget, right? Correct. have one more thing. I didn't know if you wanted to address it now or wait until you have a um, fully set board um, after the March elections, but one of the things that's been coming up with um, doing payroll and how the um, school board stipends are handled, um, what we've been trying to do is try to get everybody on a monthly payment. So you would get like a payment at the end of every month so that way when there is turnover between a um, person leaving, leaving that's moved out of town, or um, a newly elected official, or anything like that. So we, to me, it's to keep it cleaner. You divide the salary by 12 months, and you get one paycheck at the end of every month. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to wait and see if you guys wanted to do that until you had a fully stacked board. But that's how Northwood's done it for years. Um, I just got nine here to approve it last week. Um, I just think it makes everything nice and. Dr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, let's see. Scott, I skipped Scott. Because oh, <laughs> it says assistant superintendent, so I skipped Scott. So. <laughs> if 
passed my report out a few moments ago to you. It wasn't in this one. I know. <laughs> Believe me, it took a while to figure out why it wasn't today because it was written on the 16th, but we found it. Um, we've got staff evals set for the 13 employees that I supervise. Hopefully we'll have those done in the first two weeks of March. That's our, our uh, target. Mrs. Cloud and Mr. Byrne have begun to coordinate extended school year services and take care of student needs. Um, I have scheduled a meeting with speech and OT, not from your building, the SAU speech and OT. Um, I already met with the OTs. Um, your census is fluctuating in different places across the district, so we're going to eliminate the purchase service agreement for Stratford Learning Center for the supervision of the CODA, and then the two SAU OTs are going to pick up that supervision. Um, the internet safety presentation from Katie Greer that happened about a month ago was a success. Um, the kids seemed to enjoy it. They were well engaged and behaved for the whole presentation, and the parents were well engaged and behaved at night, too. Um, we had about 30 parents, which is pretty okay for a parent night. Uh, the parents asked really good questions, um, and it was a good presentation. I had to postpone the Judge Broderick night with the topic of mental health, um, and you can see in my conversation with him why he feels that's happening. Now we're working on trying to rename it from a parent night to a community night. Um, and then I will do some um, work to increase attendance. So is that for all three towns? Um, and then this says this past week, but it was about two weeks ago. Um, I attended the Legislative Priorities Workshop offered by the New Hampshire School Administrators Association. Um, Senator Maggie Hassan was our keynote, and then we had questions for Senator Regan and Representative Ladd um, about some school um, legislation that's in the works. You can see your uh, census from last night, I mean from last month, <coughs> and the corresponding increases in students with disabilities. Any questions? Thank you. Anything else? That's it for me for now. Talk to you on. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. <clears throat> My report begins on page 29 in the packet. Uh, lots of good things going on is the theme of my report that I wanted to, and I'm happy to, to give some snapshots of. Um, our curriculum crew team continues to do some great work. Um, coming in early for meetings, um, we've kind of actually increased these meetings recently as we've done more curriculum alignment work and we really begin to look at competencies. Um, and so we had a meeting recently with a team of about just 11 or 12 uh, teachers. I'm just Gary and our assistant principal also was on that uh, committee. And if you look at page 32, this is a template that we used and this is sort of a template to figure out how to build a competency now that the New Hampshire DOE already has designed competencies for um, most of the core content areas, which is great. They're in spans. They're in K2 spans, 3-5 spans, and so on. But we did this from the inside out. We're not going to literally build every competency because we don't need to do that. That wheel's already been created. But we wanted the team to try building the competency from one of the standards that we have uh, been looking at through the curriculum alignment process and try it from the inside out. So it was a great process to get a glimpse of how a competency works and this idea of a transfer of knowledge and skills into a new context or, or a new situation and why it's what that looks like from a, uh, from a teaching standpoint and from a, a curriculum standpoint. So um, we are going to kind of use that as a springboard into talking more specifically with more depth about competencies and, and who is moving that direction. The first um, critical step is the one that we hope to complete really by um, early next year, which is a fully aligned, standards aligned curriculum that we are all responsible and accountable to teaching. So we're not standards referenced, we're standards aligned in our instruction. So this is sort of, we're trying to get ahead of the work we're already doing with this team so that hopefully we can this team can then begin to share on what competency-based education really looks like as we get ready for that next phase. 
We also have a math PLC group that we just started a few weeks ago with um, Mr. Gom, Mr. Nato, Mrs. Nevins, and myself. We're hoping to branch this out. Can I go back to the conferences? Yeah, sure. When, when, is, when do you plan on rolling? Compensies out. What is your goal? A year, two years? I would year? say, I would say probably in a year. A year. Yeah, okay. because I think the curriculum alignment work we're doing with Dr. Driscoll will be more, will be really pretty firm by the conclusion of this year, and then we can start looking at developing some common assessments, and I think that will be our gateway into really looking at competencies. Um, so. We, um, that would be my thought, Bruce, is I think we probably have another year before we really start to... You're going to start with the social competencies and economic competencies? Are you going to put about both at the same time? Yeah. Um, my inclination, but that's all it is, so I don't want to describe it as a plan, is to look at the work-study habits first, because they're so broad and overarching, yeah. and they kind of create a good opportunity to think about competencies with, with a little bit less risk, than an academic or core content area typically provides. We can kind of get our, our hands and our minds around what that looks like. And it does dovetail nicely with some of the character ed stuff that we've done this year um, already through, through our, our guidance programs. So we already have some content that aligns with the work study habits. Does your team plan any visits to any school? Any schools doing competency yet? And I know there's one, King School in uh, Portland is doing it. I know that. I don't know if there's any others around. Well, uh, here, Sanborn Regional Sanborn, well, they, is, they, you know, they, sort of the yeah the pinnacle of that. But Rochester schools have yeah. also been among the leaders in that as well. Um, SAU 16 has done quite a bit of work with Rose Colby, who's yeah. one of those yeah. well-known names in competency education. Um, so I we haven't talked about that specifically, but I think it would be a great opportunity for us to make it more concrete. What, you know, it's what we can have conversations. This little exercise that we did with the competency, with our uh, curriculum team, helped to make the competency process a little bit more practical, more concrete, um, more understandable. But talking with teachers who have already are in year two, three, whatever of implementation, would definitely be another part of that. That could be a great experience. Yeah. That's a good idea. The math PLC team essentially. I don't want to uh, infer that this is the first time we've asked the question, what does excellent math instruction assessment look like at Stratford School? Because in some ways, we're asking questions like that all the time with instruction. But very specifically, we want to really kind of look at that as a team. And so we've, it's really just the tip of the iceberg, looking at math instruction, looking at math intervention, um, thinking about things like a Title I interventionist for math, for example, or a topic of conversation we've had recently looking at the fact that um, the, there's a real shift in mathematics instruction which, which aligns completely with competencies from sort of drills and procedures and getting the answer right by knowing the formulas into a shift to conceptual understanding and really teaching for conceptual understanding because it's if you understand if you teach in that way students can uh, have a much broader base to engage in math problems because it's not simply do they know the formula. Yes, I know the formula, now I can get the answer. We want to teach the conceptual understanding at those higher levels of knowledge so that they can then engage in a wider array of mathematics and do so with, with more competence and confidence. So, um, so Scott, you mentioned um, a Title I math mm -hmm. teacher. So would you have to apply for more Title I funds, or would you take the existing funds and divide it, right. and reassign the money? I don't think the, the current Title I monies would probably support okay. uh, both. Um, but we could look at some different models. Like for instance, uh, one model would be thinking about our reading support and repositioning our reading support mm -hmm. and looking at the title, converting the Title I for reading into a Title I for math. Mm -hmm. That's a concept. It's really, again, more of a concept. But the other would be looking at a, an additional funded position through Title I for math intervention. We could have it through Title I. Why wouldn't we do that? Um, it's really grant. just about the mechanics of the right. of the grant process, right. and, and and there is an approval process as right. well. So there were, would be steps we would need to take to see if, right. if that's something we can do. Um, but it's it's a good conversation. Yeah. Um, so really, that's the conversations we've had about are about um, having strong 
really having strong instruction K to eight when it comes to math instruction, so that kids, um, so that our teaching sort of links at each level. Um, we don't. We want teachers to. We don't want teachers to feel like they are teaching from a script because that's not helpful. But we also want to have some common agreements about what great math instruction looks like, um, and then allow teachers to 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 teach in their classrooms with those common agreements sort of embedded in what they do instructionally. So, um, it's like I said, it's a tip of the iceberg. We've had a couple meetings at this point, but um, I'm excited about some of the conversation that we've started. Um, so we'll see where that takes us. Again, all these teachers are coming in sort of off the clock, so to speak. They're willing to come in and have this conversation and really kind of dig into looking at math instruction, which I think is pretty neat. One thing that's not in my report around professional learning is we did have Dr. Boothroyd come uh, the two Fridays ago uh, and offer continuing support in instructional coaching in readers and writers workshop. Uh, we're kind of we're, we're upping our game a little bit. She's, uh, teachers are now giving demonstration lessons, which she's then observing. And then they're debriefing, and she's giving feedback on what she sees from the workshop model. How, what are some areas of strength? What are some areas that they can strengthen? And those have been really big conversations for her to have. So we're kind of moving towards better, stronger and stronger expertise mm -hmm. in the workshop models uh, with, with Dr. Boothroyd's support. So that's, that's been positive. Uh, school safety and security. These are updates, and obviously in part in light of the recent concerns, which are, we all know about, tragic and traumatic things that have happened in other parts of the country. Um, but I did want you to have these details um, in hand. And really, I can't, I can't be more specific than what's described here right. in, in my report. Right. But I'm wondering if there are any either questions or thoughts based on what is shared there. Um, no, but I know that we are going to discuss the grant, um, I don't know. I know okay. Did you get it? Did you get the grant in on time? That, it, it, they haven't done it yet. Or the. Uh, they haven't done it yet. It was reported out that the governor's fund is starting to get yeah. smaller. I yeah. believe it is. It's out of twenty million. I believe it's down to five. Right. I know it's doing more. Yep. March fifth is our deadline. So. But it's, it's rolling. Yes. Right. right. Yep. So, I I know that we were. We were told at our joint board meeting that some of the any concerns we have, any safety concerns or plans to create a safer building is not to be discussed in public for obvious reasons. So I'm hoping we're going to go into tonight public later on to discuss the grant and the details of things we're looking to fund. Yes. Okay. Yep. Right. So again, so we, you know, we, the, I'll, I'll just sort of quickly brush over these pieces. We do have a, a safety and joint loss management committee that meets monthly. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the constituents that are part of that committee. They've done some great work mm -hmm. uh, this year in taking a look at our emergency <laughs> operation plan, making sure it's up to date, which has been submitted uh, to the DOE. Uh, we routinely do drills. We'll be doing a lockdown drill, actually, when we come back from the break. We let parents know that we're going to be doing that prior to the break in a quick letter or note to them. Uh, it's just a part of our typical routine. It's not related to recent concerns per se. It's what we do um, in terms of preparation. And um, the SAU provided a great letter that we put out to uh, community members and families um, in the wake of what happened down in Florida uh, around different resources they could have or might want to access for their family or for their kids if they're dealing with some difficult emotions at home. Uh, and I did, a, again, a note or a letter um, prior to the break, trying to give people a snapshot of the fact that we're on top of safety and security here in the building, and at least giving them a little bit of um, uh, some reassurance and information on how, we're, how we go about doing that. So some good things there, some good work being done by the, by the committee. We had a winter carnival. <laughs> I don't know if we've had one here in Stratford previously at, in other buildings. I've been in, we've done that. Maybe in the past couple <coughs> years prior to my coming, uh, Stratford has done that. It was fun. It was right before the February break. I gave you a, just for the, for the fun of it, uh, uh, this handout. It's also in my report, but it's so dark that you can't read it. Of the different kinds of activities the kids did. Um, we had just about every teacher in the building um, supervising and helping with one or more of these activities. Myself, Mrs. Pagarian also. 
And we had a great time in our assembly um, where teachers tried out a few different um, relay races and some different things that the kids really enjoyed and get a kick out of. Uh, a good time was had by all, no injuries, um, which is a good thing. Uh, and it was just a lot of fun. So I want to give a lot of kudos to Ms. Uh, Atkinson, who's leading our student council group, as well as the student council kiddos. Uh, who did a tremendous amount of organization and planning and prepping to have that time uh, for us last Friday go off well. Uh, so a good time was had by all. We have Read Across America coming up. Um, there is a handout, again, in your packet um, on page 35. that gives a snapshot of, of some of the activities we're going to be doing throughout the week. I want to make sure that I, um, in my report on page 30, it says Friday, March 2nd. It should be, because we probably won't do that this Friday. Be anyone here. Um, it's Friday, March 9th, that we're going to have our kickoff assembly. Mrs. Sununu is going to be here as our special guest uh, to do some reading to the kids, which is pretty neat. Um, I am going to be uh, playing a song that I have composed for Read Across America Week. Yes, I am a composer. What's that? A piano. A piano. What is this? The banana suit and cricket is for later. That's okay. if, if we read a thousand books. Teachers, kiddos, if we read a thousand books by the end of the month, then I will be in a banana suit eating a well-seasoned cricket. Can I cook it? I, I think it's going to be dead. But you no, can cook it. Oh, no. you got to do it. I'm not doing it live. good source of protein. Oh, yeah. I mentioned the they same thing. They're yeah. excellent source of protein. I've never tried a seasoned bug, but I'm going to if we read a thousand books. So the parents that are listening, if you want to not read books, that's fine with me. Oh, no. I'm just kidding. Oh, read them. We're going to the library March 1st. <laughs> My kids read a lot of books. Uh, um, so it will be a fun way to motivate the kids, although really... Read Across America has been a big success for us in, in the years that I've been here, too. So. Uh, again, the great planning and preparation from our literacy team, Mrs. Clinch, Mrs. Uh, Woodward, and uh, Mrs. Homias particularly. Um, they are the ones who talked me into all of that stuff. It will be fun. It's all good. Uh, Arts Month is also coming up. Um, and again, I, I handed out a separate handout. This, this handout is also in your packet, but it's very difficult to read. And you can see that we're going to be doing some fun stuff. Uh, throughout Arts Month, creating some great works of art, or we will be creating some great works of art that will be here in the building that sort of remain as artifacts of the kids' work. We're doing some mixed art kinds of elements um, through, the, through the month, and we're going to be having some special guests come in both to classrooms and in some assembly settings and demonstrate uh, their different art proficiencies. And so we're excited about um, celebrating <coughs> art and creativity and, and giving the kids lots of opportunities in um, in art classes to try out some different mediums that they that they typically don't try out. So. And Mark Holt Shannon is returning. Yes, I, okay, I'm not sure if you, you've been here before. And uh, Mrs. Kern, our own He's Sarah teaching. Kern. Oh, really? Okay. He's an English teacher. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, the FYI piece is on the Stratford Spring, Spring Art Studio. This is a further rebrand as we've done in the past, as we've done in the fall and other springs. I didn't want to run it by you as an FYI. Again, the, the art studio experience is on page 38 with some details of what we planned, but um, it always ends up being a big hit for kids to participate in that uh, experience that will be read by, led by Miss Ray. Um, and you can see some of the things they're going to be doing and working on. Celebration points. There's a lot of them. Um, second grade hosted their third annual annual robots fair. Um, the kids try out just the idea of creating a robot. Now most of them don't have mechanical features, but uh, they're all very inventive and creative, and the kids love showing them off to families and uh, teachers and administrators that come in. So good stuff there. I mentioned student council, Miss Atkinson, with their work on the Winter Carnival, which is awesome. 
Um, a thank you to Mrs. Lane and Ms. Figueri and a number of other staff and faculty who helped chaperone the Valentine's uh, dance that we had, which was a big success. Uh, lots and lots of kids here um, and a really positive experience for students, which was great. The Arts Committee for the work that they did setting up our Arts Month coming up, Mrs. Jordan, Ms. Ray, Mrs. Irons, Mrs. Hossack, and Ms. Adams. Um, just a big thank you to them, and I mentioned Mrs. Homer, Mrs. Clinch, and Mrs. Woodward as well. Thank you. Move on to page 39. <coughs> I wanted to just share one more thing if I could. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, there's there really is a lot of great work happening in the building. And uh, a lot of folks who are, are willing to go the extra mile in a lot of ways for kids. And um, I was not able to attend the budget hearing. I was I had an upper respiratory infection that was just kind of waylaid me, and, and that kind of caught me off guard, actually, so I wasn't able to be here. Um, he wouldn't have wanted me here, to be honest with you, with the way I sounded. Um, but I wanted to say, because it was, it was difficult to hear of some of the board's decisions um, around our, uh, the halftime counselor position. Uh, it was difficult uh, to hear uh, the continuing discussion about the assistant principal role. Um, I know that the board has a challenging job, and I really can't even pretend to understand each aspect of that. I can tell you about my job and its difficulties, but that's really neither here nor there. Um, I did end up meeting with the staff and faculty after the budget hearing, and I want you to know that its impact on me and on the staff and faculty was really tough. Um, because they do, our staff and faculty are not perfect, I'm certainly not perfect by any means, um, but we do try to work really hard, um, and we try to be very intentional and thoughtful about each part of what we do for kids. And um, it felt to me like the conversation around the part-time guidance counselor had been well thought out um, and had been presented in a thoughtful way with quite a bit of preparation. It seemed that there was real agreement about its need and how it was going to impact our kids positively. And it was disheartening uh, and frustrating to have that uh, removed. And as it regards the assistant principal position, as I've said in the past, so it's really not a new thing, I can tell you that it's a critical role. Um, I know that there's there are guidelines around uh, school public school approval in terms of uh, student population numbers, but as we said in the past, it really has very little to do with a population at a given school and what that creates for need it could be very different. Number one, number two, really as a guideline, it has nothing to do with best practices. And I can tell you, and I, I think it's worth saying, I think it's important to say actually, that Mrs. Pergarian has been an absolute wonderful asset to our school this year. Uh, she has been a tremendous um, person for me to work with as an, as an administrator and as an administrative team. Her value in terms of what she does each day for kids and our staff and faculty is, is literally a daily occurrence with, the, with the, the things that she does and the benefit that she brings kids and families. Um, and so reflecting both my own sentiments and feelings as well as for the staff and faculty, um, it really is tough to experience what we experienced after the budget hearing and feel that there's that very key and important support from the board for doing what we feel we need to do for the best of kids. And I'm not saying that you don't care what's best for kids, because I believe that you all do. But it sent a very difficult and, and seemingly, in my opinion, wrong message to our staff and faculty about what's important. Um, and as I told them, I want to speak on behalf of our school community. I want to do so respectfully, and I hope that you understand that uh, that's the spirit in which I'm speaking to you tonight. Uh, but I do think that those things are important to say. Um, people work hard, and I'm not saying that other people don't work hard at other schools or in other endeavors or in other, uh, their, whatever other people do for work. I, I get that. I'm not looking for a pat on the back for us, but I do think it's important to emphasize um, the investment that our staff and faculty has every day in the kids that we work with. Um, and I would just ask 
for the board to reflect a little bit uh, on my comments uh, and uh, take them to heart. And uh, I appreciate you allowing me to speak. Uh, we, we are sensitive to the needs of the school. We have looked, and there was nothing personal in the removal of our discussion of removals. It is about bringing a, a budget to the town that the town people will vote on and accept. I've been on the board for a while, as you know. I have been in meetings where townspeople see how much the tax rate is going up, and they will come to the floor of the meeting in March, and they'll make an amendment to cut a certain amount. If there's a groundswell at that meeting, we have to be prepared to deal with that. So we were looking at ways to trim a little bit. We didn't put our capital improvements in there this year. We didn't put the capital improvements for the building or for special needs children. We took both of those out this year, which that we were building on to keep for crisis at some point. We took those out. We took, we looked at everything that we could to get to a budget where we hope the people of the town will support. I've been at the meetings where they, they motion to take out sixty to a hundred thousand dollars. If that was to happen, we would be looking at teachers and class sizes going up. I think the commitment of the board keeping the class sizes small was one of the things that we were looking at to do in that case. And I, and I, I mean, again, no, I'm not the, done, but okay. okay. Yeah. He's not done. I'm sorry. Just, it's, it's okay. I'd like to speak to you No, the, uh, we, we pride ourselves in keeping small class sizes in Stratford. My kids went through it. Okay, they did well with the small class sizes. And we're aiming to keep those small class sizes. We have a first grade or a kindergarten that is going to grow. Okay. We're going to need money to make sure that those positions are funded to keep those classes small. It's critical for the smaller age kids to have smaller classes and to have more individualized attention. So we were looking at all of that creating a budget. I'm sorry that you weren't here. Not, I'm sorry that you were sick at that time. But it wasn't a reflection on what the school personnel was doing. They are wonderful and mm -hmm. they do the best job they absolutely can. All right? And I, I, I'm totally proud of the reputation that Stratford School has as well as going on to Cool Brown. Uh, so there wasn't anything personal meant by that. It was all coming up with a figure mm -hmm. that we could present to the town uh, to get a budget passed. Our problem is our revenues. The state has cut back our adequacy aid, Marjorie, right? huge. All right, they've cut back uh, oh, giant amounts of money for us that we could use to come in with a budget that would be acceptable for everybody. But right now, the budget's coming in at it's a dollar forty-two on the tax rate, I believe, right now. Is that right, Monty? Is it a dollar eighty? Yeah, it's a dollar eighty, a dollar forty-two. I mean, so we took out our capital improvements and all those <laughs> just to keep that at that rate. We haven't had a jump that big in a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's because of less revenues and less money that we have accumulated during the year from our budget to turn back in. We've turned back 400000 I believe, last year. We're turning back 170 this year. Maybe. 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 Exactly. And that's Don't what I would need. Huh? Don't get ahead of me. I know, I know. But I mean, that's as only a, if you froze the budget but, right Yeah, second. if we froze it, which we don't want to do. Yeah. We're frozen budgets in the past. We don't want to freeze the budget and get the people that. Uh, so we're trying to get something that that everybody can live with and get it passed on the, on the floor of the, uh, the March meeting. Now. The petition warrant, warrant article for the uh, guidance is great because the people decide. Mm -hmm. The voters decide. It's not put in the budget where they cut something and we have to cut something. Mm -hmm. Okay? They will decide whether they want or not. I think, I think it works perfect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a great way of doing it. Are you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, okay. <laughs> I, I have more, but go ahead. I, all right. I, okay. What, what I want to just say is, and, and I've been talking to community members about this because it just social media has made this into something people have not gotten the entire picture, just getting bits and pieces. Um, so I, I wanted to explain the process. When we work on the budget, at the beginning of the process, we are working with numbers that usually change as we get more information. 
Okay, the budget process is usually about two months long. So the night that we had the presentation by our guidance counselor, it was an incredible presentation and it was uh, compelling. At that point, the budget that was presented to us, even with that part-time position, was down from last year's budget. I have the numbers right here. So the reason it was down was because at that point, um, we knew that we had a teacher retiring in fourth grade. We weren't replacing that teacher due to numbers. So having adding the $20,000 or so to the budget, it was okay because we're still coming in below last year. So we felt this is great. This is the year to add that position. Then we found out about the adequacy money. Our adequacy money is down almost $200,000 from last year. And it's not that the state cuts our adequacy money. Our adequacy money is based on a formula. It's based on the amount of children we have in the district. So we have less kids, we're getting less money. Okay, so that happened. Next, we found out, about two, two meetings after that, that our transportation costs were going up $70,000. Okay, we didn't know that when we approved the guidance counseling position. Then we got our CB, our Co Brown budget information. That line, our budget, our, our regular ed, Co Brown tuition line, increased and went up to, um, it went up almost $200,000. Okay? We weren't prepared for that. That was after, again, so now our budget is no longer below last year. Now we're going up. And we have less kids. Okay, so then our preschool tuition went up um, almost 7%, okay, $6,000. Our SAU portion of the budget after the joint board, met, it went up $6,000 six increase, Scott. Then right, our, kids. yes, yeah. I'm just saying it went up. I, I saw, your, I, I saw your, your pen Well, like, it wasn't a tuition rate, okay. it was a number of kids. Oh, the line went up, okay. Then um, the portion, our portion of the SAU <clears> budget <throat> Went up twelve thousand dollars because we get raises and whatever. Okay, that went up twelve thousand dollars. Then, January tenth, our school board meeting, the meeting before our budget hearing, we found out our tax impact ten percent increase from last year. That means if you have if you're paying six thousand dollars right now, you're going to go up six hundred dollars. That's huge. So when we went to the budget hearing which we do every year. It was, you know, a little bit, people don't understand the process, you know, that, oh, it's, you know, we had some negative comments about that we then came back after the meeting to refine our budget. That's what we do every year, every year. We wait to get public input. We hear people questioning, well, can you cut that down? Can you cut that down? People were hearing about the 10% increase. Bruce came up with a suggestion. Um, I was looking at another way to deal with it. Um, but it was okay. We know that we have that fifth grade position in the um, budget. That is sort of, we, we put that in knowing, well, that's money that we have in. If we were going to use a fifth grade, we might need it someplace else. We could even take that money, get a part-time guidance counselor, also get a, a, a full-time para for the first grade, depending on the numbers, because we know that the numbers fluctuate. And we don't know, you know, what our numbers really will be next year for for the first grade or kindergarten until we get a little bit closer. Um, so it's, it's a process and it's very hard to be in this position where you're trying to balance doing what's best for the kids but also for their parents and grandparents so they can still afford to live here. It's, it's a very hard, hard job. And no one, you can't make people happy. I mean, nobody's ever happy. Um, and we think you're doing a great job, the teachers are doing a great job, um, but people have to understand that part-time guidance position was not something we cut. It was a proposed new position for this year, for this next year. It wasn't something we took out of the budget. We've had you know a, a two guidance counselors the past couple of years. We have not because our numbers have gone down. Um, so I just I just want to make that clear because I it's we work so hard trying to be fair and do what's best for the kids and also for the, the townspeople and um, it's not something personal. You know, and, I mean, 
I know Bruce has brought up a couple of times looking at, okay, what are the state mandates for having an assistant principal and, a, and guidance counselors? So he's looking at that saying, okay, would it be better than to add like another teacher if we didn't have to have an assistant principal or if we didn't have to have this? So we're looking at creative ways to do things. I thought, okay, hey, I know that a career path for many assistant principals is your guidance counselor first. And it's not, the, it's not a personal attack. It's nothing personal. It's just saying, okay, if you have this position and a certain amount of money and you want more help dealing with you know, maybe kids are having issues or build bullying or anything like that, maybe you could make a hybrid position. So that was something I brought up. Um, so this is just creative brainstorming to see what we could do to satisfy the needs and have a budget that doesn't cause hardship to the people in the community. That's, and it's not to insult anyone personally, okay? And, and the guidance, as I said, the guidance presentation was very impressive. And, you know, that's why at that time we supported it. Before we had all the other numbers that we ended up getting by January. Thank you, Debbie. Okay. I can't beat that, but <clears throat> the enrollment, I look at it very closely. And we right now we have good size eighth grade and we have a huge seventh grade. So we're, we're going to be graduating, well it was 120, right now it's 118 between the seventh and eighth grade. Two years. I don't see us bringing in 60 kindergartens every for the next two years. It would be most closer to 40. The average has been 38.2 over the last 10 years. We're so I see us bringing in 80 and graduating 120. So we could be down to 380 students in two years. So we have to, that's what tells the story. We will know as soon as we have that in May when we have the pre, you know, the kindergarten screening, how many kids, a real close number of how many kids we'll have. And that, we will we'll react to that. Believe yeah, me. Yeah, I just want to, yeah, so, I mean, again, the, the, um, I, I have a, I understand the conversation or I understand the need to take a look at the numbers. I just want to let you know that it, maybe there isn't any way for this to be impacted or maybe this is just an inevitability of the work that you guys do. What happens in the message mm -hmm. is the message sounds an awful lot like we've got to return money to the, to the town, heck or high water. And if that means we have to cut here or cut there or talk about the assistant principal and they can't, it ends up sounding, it's very depersonalized. And the set, like I said, maybe, there's, maybe that's an inevitability. Maybe, but I, I would ask, or I would at least ask, I think it's reasonable for me to say, just recognize that for each of, the, each of these pieces, there's a person mm -hmm. in this piece. Mm -hmm. And so, personally, and I'm, again, I, what a, this isn't my job, so it doesn't really matter what I think ultimately. But personally, I don't know that this forum is the best place for those kinds of conversations to take place because they can be so easily misconstrued. It might be a better, there might be a better setting for have a discussion. So, in other words, uh, Debbie might reach out to me, and, to, and you and I have a chance to meet. You have some ideas about what personnel might look like, or some different changes. That setting might be a better setting for a conversation like that, because it ends up invariably having less impact than in a in a public setting when words are used in a way that really tend to um, that, that that do create a sense of, as you said, being insulted. Whether that I don't believe that was the intent, mm -hmm. but I do think that that is the result in a number of times. The, we have the other part that's coming up too, which is the fact finders report, mm -hmm. which I was the one that supported it. Okay, we need to give our teachers a contract. They need to be working under a contract. They cannot keep going year to year without a contract. It should have be a multiple year contract to sew things up and put people at ease at that point. I'm sure that's angst on their part from us, and that is not what we intend to do. Uh, the the opposition was based on enrollment when I was on the board, and we ballooned up to 600 <coughs> students at Stratford School. We had the vice principal at that point. Okay. 
Right. Sure. Uh, you remember the first vice principal? Yes, yeah. yeah, people went up. Now we're down to 400. Okay. Just for 400 and change. Okay. And uh, that's a third of the kids. That's a third of the students have, have moved out of the area. I mean, uh, moved on. So, and as Gary says, it's, it's, it's the enrollment's still projected to go down in the next couple of years. So, we're looking at different kind of projections. Kathy, I'm sorry that it, if you if it was it sounded personal, it wasn't. Well, it wasn't. I know that the the piece that Scott asked yeah. that I would like to speak to is mentioned in the other, and it does directly relate to all of this. But I'll wait. Okay. Um, it wasn't a personal. It was it was numbers, and we're looking at numbers in that. And if you knew far enough ahead, you could prepare for that. Mm -hmm. However, it, it, when you say it's based on people, the part time guidance person, that there is no person attached to that. That that is an additional person that no, would be coming in. We would not be we would not be letting somebody go or, or remove somebody. No, I right, that I understand that. I, again, and we we didn't do that to one of the uh, classroom teachers when the enrollments are low well on classes. You know, when there's class sizes of fourteen and seventeen, I still support that that size because I want the kids to get the most individualized attention that they possibly can get. I'd rather keep that because Strapper is always coming out. One of the top, the, the, the top kids that graduate co Brown or other schools that they go to, because I believe in the class, small class sizes. And we really have to. Have, we we can't have these discussions when it comes to the budget in private. It's a public document. It's, public, public we, it's a public hearing. We have to talk about it in public. And so it's hard. They're hard conversations to have. And I, again, I I apologize if it offended anyone. Because it wasn't meant to be personal. No, and okay, I'll, I'll speak to that because okay. it it certainly did have a tremendous impact on mm -hmm. me, and I want to share that with you guys. Just okay. how it felt, and and I watched the meeting, and I listened to it, and I read the minutes, and and I want to speak directly to that. Mm -hmm. Well, the minutes weren't point. accurate, but we just corrected them. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I, I, have, um, thank you. I don't know if we're, thank you, yeah. I wanted to share, and we need to get that into the minutes about the, um, with the lawyer, we asked Brian to contact the, our attorney about what it would mean if the fact finder's report was um, approved, mm -hmm. and I have his response because we wanted that in the minutes so people understood it. And I'm going to forward this to you. Oh. Okay. All right, so Brian wrote, um, Brian wrote to our attorney and asked what would it mean if um, the fact finder's report was approved. And the attorney said, you are correct that if Article 3 is approved by the voters, the funds, i.e. the cost items, which the fact finder recommends for settlement will be appropriated. However, this does not settle the contract. Even though the fact finder's report must go to the voters as a total package, the school district's vote on non-cost items does not bind either the school board or the teachers association. In fact, only the school board and not the legislative body, i.e. the school district voters, has the authority to negotiate and enter into a collective bargaining agreement with the association. This would still need to occur in the event of a voter <coughs> approval of Article 3. In this regard, there can be no change in the status quo without the agreement of both the school board and the association. As previously noted by the New Hampshire Supreme Court, even though the school district's vote may not be, may be non-binding on cost items, it does serve to heighten public scrutiny of the, of the negotiations and may <coughs> increase the pressure on the parties to reach an agreement. So, and that's um, from Peter Phillips, the attorney for the school district. So I will make sure you get that immediately for the minutes because we want the public to understand what will happen if they vote yes, so they can see the minutes. Okay? That was it. Anything else? Uh, Let's move on the agenda. Well, I think we have the calendar on page 13. No. That I proposed. I'd like to table that. Okay. New board. Mm -hmm. Decision. Next. <coughs> On page 40. <coughs> Let's see. 
So the um, the SAU day in March, the other districts have changed to a student day or, or some other um, constellation. I can't remember. Right. <laughs> it's out of my head. Um, so Dr. Gadomsky put this in here. So you, now the 19th should. Are you talking about the calendar? Yep. No, the this year's calendar. Okay. We just did with that for the no, no, that next board. That's for, so for this year's. We have to make a decision about this year, not no. not next year. Well, you're talking about something that's coming up next week. What's coming up next? This, the the um, the calendar for the 17, 18, and 18, 19. Right. It's right. I see. Well, it's about facilities and it's about um, that you know we usually have the district wide right. student mm -hmm. workshop, the teacher workshop. Right, so, so you're talking about the 23rd? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, asking you if you want to make that a student day, that'll gain you two days at the end of the week of the June 18th. So um, you don't know what's going to happen between now and April when it comes to storms and pushing people over. Into the what's the union day. said? That's negotiated in the contract. Uh, I don't think the end dates are. I, I have a question. Did you say the other districts are not having that as a teacher workshop day? They, uh, they're either um, Nottingham has made it a student day and they're going to have a teacher workshop day on a half day later to get the staff CPR trained. Co Brown now has a student day that day, right? The, yeah, I believe Co Brown has a student day that day. And Northwood? I wasn't at the Northwood meeting. Okay. Well, the whole point of having that teacher's workshop day in March was to have everyone in the SAU, all the teachers get together with the Co-Brown teachers, and it was, you know, a day of sharing and, and doing things together. So if the other schools aren't doing it, I would think it makes sense to use it as a student day so then the kids can get out of school earlier, not go into July. But my question is, why don't, why isn't the superintendent propose a waiver for the two power days that would be ended back on at the end of the year. He power believe, power is totally different than a snow storm. So. He doesn't believe that we'll get approved because mm. we already have five days built in. We asked storm. that. Yeah, he said he didn't think we could do it. Because we already have five days built at the end. Mm -hmm. Are we exceeding the five days built? Sorry. Are we exceeding the five days that are built into the calendar? Not yet. Not yet. You're at five. One, two, we're at two power days and three snow days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't see why we have to change things now for the... You certainly can leave it the same and Dr. Young can use it as a day. He yeah, yeah. could, uh, for could appeal the power days to the state. Sure. I, the I, state's I, always granted any, any kind of act like that as long as you exceed the days, but we've only gone to four, not five yet. Would you I, like? I, I, I disagree, though. I think that we should, I think the kids should go to school so that they don't have to go to school longer in June. I, I, I mean, it's, I don't know. The whole purpose of that particular teacher workshop day is that it is an SAU-wide wide day where everything is planned for the teachers to do things together in the different districts. And if it's not happening, it doesn't, it, it, you know, why should the kids have to go to school in late June? I don't know. So would you move that teacher workshop day to the end of the year? Mm -hmm. Yes. Even if if they, you do that, I have no problem with it. Okay. And I think you're good with the CBA. <coughs> Would that be checked on? Yeah, CBA does have the teacher workshop. Says the work year for professional employees shall consist of 188 days. The eight contraction days beyond the school year are approved one day prior to the start, and then there's one day following. Okay. Yeah. We've this, done this, this would before. move two days to the following. Year. Yeah, I don't know if that's breaking. That's what I'm asking. Teacher work day is to adequately prepare and pick up the classrooms of one day in May for student for student placement. So I mean, you can make your decision, and then if we get a grievance, we can mm -hmm. revisit it. 
you assume we'll this is I, I don't. I don't think we will. Well, no. So I think we've done this before. Yeah, we have done it before. I know we've done it before. Because it was, it's a, you know, well, we a problem done it to with lose. That day, but I think we've done mm -hmm. it with other day. Yeah. So do you need a motion, or do you? Can you just say this is the consensus? Okay, I'll make a motion to. Um, have March 23rd as a student day and the teacher workshop moved to the end of the year. Second. Do we need that pending approval by the, the student the SEA. SEA? Okay, pending approval by the SEA. That would make it clean. Okay. If the SEA says yes, then yep. that would go on if the SEA says no. Mm -hmm. They want to keep it there. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Did you second that? I did. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. I'll go along with aye. We got guidance from the federal government that um, there'll be a flexibility formula coming out, which means that if you elect to do it, and of course it's a stay tuned right now, um, instead of having IDA separate, so just mm -hmm. take IDA out, but Title I, Title II, REAP um, will all be based on per pupil, and you can flexibly use the money in different places. I'm not sure if that's going to be a benefit or a cost, um, but that was from Washington in 2018. When will uh, we hear more about that? When they actually figure out what they're going to okay. do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's lots of interesting literature. Uh, but they haven't really said whether it's going to go up, down, or it's going to decrease. Mm -hmm. it, but there'll be some flexibility within those entitlements, other than IDEA, um, for money to be combined. And so when you're talking about, you know, you could do you could combine different things. So that's sort of up in the air, but it did come out on the 18th of February. And then really the only other thing I have is a personal report. Before we do that, Marjorie, what about the Kino money? Is there anything coming to us from, from the governor's proposal for Kino for kindergarten? It's a dumb deal. Yeah, $1,100 per student. We'll be getting $1,100 per student. Per kindergarten student. Based so that, on. That didn't reflect in the uh, revenue not, sheet. Nope, not for your tax impact for next year. So theoretically, oh, yeah. there's another $40,000 if you get to 40 students. For, for, for next year or the year after? They will. For next year, it will be next year. Okay. Not this year. Okay. Thank you. So there goes that tax impact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think they'll base it off. I want to say, it's been a while. I want to say they'll base this year's the money you'll get in the next fiscal year off of this October one alone. Yeah, I was going right? to say this October yeah. first. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to be uh, a done deal. Of course, we haven't gotten a letter saying we're going to give you, but I'm sure we will. So that's good. Good. And then uh, the only other grant thing is. Title IV competitives came out. I have a meeting with Scott tomorrow at 9.30 um, to talk about um, a competitive grant application. Either we're going to do a small grant, which is up to $29,999, or there's an option for a larger grant. Um, but him and I need to sort of weed through what we would use that money for. And where. So, there's three areas that it targets. So the small grants, you can pick one area to target. If you pick the large grant, you're going to pick three areas to target. I don't know. We've got to have that discussion tomorrow. 
but uh, so uh, like if we wanted to uh, get some <coughs> professional development and some substitute and some stipend time for competencies, you know, we could put together a week long program or two week long program and find those kind of grant. Uh, the other area is wellness, which I think is very important, and the other is technology. So based on our discussions tomorrow, we may come up with like the three prime approach and then it's the awards over um, over twenty nine thousand nine over thirty thousand. Um, so him and I will sort of look at that. I've got some simple ideas that, that may help, like um, first Lego robotics. We could, we could fund that. Uh, we could take a look at competency design for the staff. Um, we could take a look at bolstering our confidence of guidance curriculum. You know, there's all sorts of things we're going to talk about tomorrow. So we'll keep you updated. And then other than that, it's just the personnel report from page 41 to 43. So, so if you see, you have a resignation and an accompanying letter behind it, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then after that, a stipend letter. I make a motion to accept the personnel report dated February 28, 2018, as presented. Second. Discussion? No, but Dawn is still going to be coaching. She is. Good. Yeah, she just she tried to take on coaching two teams plus coordinating. She said a lot. Yeah. So. Well, thank her. Yes. All in favor of accepting the personnel report? Page 44, you have a CATA tuition request. That's a pardon. <laughs> That's, you don't need to have a motion. Yep. Oh, you, you do, but I also <laughs> want to do. Um, She typically gets the she typically gets the invoices first, <coughs> checks the enrollment, okay. gives it to Bruce. Uh, I'm sorry, to Bob. Yeah. <laughs> we do it with all um, okay, so invoices that checked. we receive from Dover, Co Brown, yeah. Cata, Exeter, Oyster River. Mm -hmm. um, but you can put that in your motion. But I'm almost positive that you. Right. I'll make a motion to um, pay the amount of fifteen hundred dollars for dollars to um, Chica. Cochico Academy of the Arts for grade 12 student for semester two, 2017 to 18. That's 3,000 a year, correct? Right? <coughs> we gotta have a second before we can discuss it. Oh, okay. Just, just well, I'll have the second. There you go. <coughs> yes, CATA is the savings. Yes, it is. It's important. Mm -hmm. For the discussion, send 200 more kids. Just Joe. Jerry. Yes. I have not received any correspondence. Oh, I'm going to. I want to. This is an email I wrote to. Is the information from, um, from, from Brian, Brian going to correspondence? Probably, yeah. So I'll forward that to you, and then. Okay, and then. Um, is there anything else? What else is in here? Presentations. Which committee? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm looking. If there's something else I was going to say. All right. You know where you're going with that? Okay. okay. <laughs> Enrollment report on page forty-five. Okay, so 47. So we're down a student. Getting three more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. So, so 
one of the seventh graders being homeschooled. Lost one of the seventh graders homeschooling. Do you still have friends? It looks like they still shut the site. You have four homeschoolers and 65 seventh graders, and now you have five homeschoolers. So it looks like they switched from being in trouble. And they just lost an eighth grader. Yeah. Oh, yes, that eighth grader moved. To, somebody moved to Nottingham because I just didn't know that. I don't know that you went to Nottingham, but I think in this enrollment report, it's going to show that you, an eighth grader, would be enrolled in a private school, right? Okay. Correct. Yeah. Somebody moved to, somebody, somebody I don't moved know. to Nottingham. Did that will show up this month. That may show up next month. Traffic community news Oh, yes. I don't know Brian usually does that. Committee updates? Anything on committees? Unfortunately, I had an education committee tonight at 6 o'clock, a student hearing, and maybe we'll be dealing with that in our public. I will share a tiny bit. I was supposed to be involved in a student hearing today and talking about interviews for staff at COBRA. Yes, we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Set future meeting dates. March 10th will be the district hearing in the gym. On that Saturday, 13th will be a town voting day. 14th will be the next regular board meeting. 26th will be the joint board meeting. 28th will be the regular board meeting all the month of March. Others? Anything for others? Public comments. Was that, was that, was that other? Yes. Other? Uh, yes, for you, yeah. So I, I want to preface Sorry. Um, that I did, I did write this down because I wanted to make sure that I was clear with how I felt so I didn't prepare it to give to anybody else, but right. I am just going to read. Um, after watching the last school board meeting um, and also reading the minutes, I wanted to take a few minutes to share with the members of the board uh, just how the words and the discussion around not only the assistant principal role, but also as they related specifically specifically, excuse me, to me in that role came across um, for me. As a professional, it was difficult to listen to the discussion that referred to me as the other administrator, my contract being referenced as only for one year, and talk about, and talk about bringing in someone with different qualifications and or the inclusion of additional responsibilities. As a person, as well as a co-leader and member of the Stratford School family, it was both dehumanizing and di disheartening. As far as my, bra my background, I would like to share some of the experience that I have as it relates to working with children, families, staff, and communities over the past 20 plus years. I have held the following positions in my career, behavior therapist, foster care worker, child protective service worker, special education teacher, case manager, general education teacher, alternative school director, and assistant principal. I'm also trained in applied behavioral analysis as well as restorative justice. While I fully recognize that it is the responsibility of the school board to have discussions and make decisions that they believe are in the best interests of Stratford School, I believe that it is important for the members to hear how their words affected me, the co-leader at the, the school, both professionally and personally. It's essential that the community understands what my credentials are um, in, in any misinformation of that that filters out into the community is counterproductive to the success of our school. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It was good to hear your credentials. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, just wanted to acknowledge as a community member. Yeah. Uh, does uh, Amelia have your name? Oh, Katie Pagnata. There you go. Um, as a community member, just want to acknowledge the inherent challenge of your position, uh, knowing that I both respect and expect that not all decisions are going to be agreed upon by many. Um, with that said, I think that I think that what I would like to advocate for as a community member is that, well, I guess to start, that we, in my opinion, live in a great town. We have, we have a gift of a great school. And to keep that going, I think that it, uh, it, there's an importance to uh, trust. Um, and I think that's essential to our community thriving as a whole. Um, no matter what camp each individual person might be coming from, whether it's the people that are ha 
have children in the school now and are advocating for what they see the needs are, or whether it's a person who doesn't have children in the school and are looking at, I'm on a fixed budget. Whatever angle all of us are coming at, I, I see it boil down to the bottom line of trust. And if we can work together on that, um, and I'm asking you as our elected school board members, um, to be transparent in the decisions that are made. And so in the future, um, and I'm new to this process, but it was my understanding that the proposed budget from the school board that's presented at the hearing um, is what the school board is proposing and advocating for unless there is uh, specific, unless there are specific comments um, which are then reflected on at the later meeting. Um, so I just ask that in the future that that transparency that um, is, that there's transparency in what is presented at the hearing is what you're advocating for uh, to be the expected budget. Um, I also ask that that you work from a stance of when you're looking for creative solutions, as we all are, um, that you include, that you come from a stance of curiosity um, because you have a job that is unknown in many ways, the ins and outs of it, to the community. The administration has a job that is unknown in lots of ways to the school board. Uh, but I ask that there's a collaboration and, a, and, and coming from a stance of curiosity um, in what the, what the ins and outs are of the roles, especially the administrative roles that are vital to the school um, when you're looking for those creative solutions. Um, <coughs> I also ask that that we're coming and, and again this is this is speaking to kind of the process, not necessarily yes, it's driven by recent events in terms of content, but it's more I'm more advocating from from a from a process stance that as a process you come from a stance of curiosity and transparency to build that underlying level of trust. And then additionally, and again I'm new to this process, so I'm not sure if I'm if this is way out of the realm of the school board or not, and I apologize if it is, but the majority of our tax increase is coming from the, the decrease in state adequacy aid. And so we're really splitting hairs when it comes to um, the tax impact of the school budget minus that state adequacy aid. And so is it within the role of the school board to advocate or work together with our town, with, with our elected officials that are at the state? Is it within, within your role to advocate at a state level to look at an impact on that advocacy aid? Because that's really the majority of where our tax impact is coming from. We do that. I go to the New Hampshire School Board Association meeting in January every year. We advocate for more money for the schools for all different programs, including the large public. Uh, pocket of adequacy aid. Mm -hmm. We do that through uh, uh, people from the, uh, Eric Christina used to do it, Dean Minster used to do it, they have new people working on it. Uh, I forget the new man's name, Will, uh, somebody, he's at the state house every day trying to get more money for the school districts mm -hmm. through the state. So we do have people working for us. And you don't know about it, and we, most people don't know about, but it's, it's through the dues and associations that we have through the New Hampshire School Board Association. Is there a way that um, that that information could be made more public so that townspeople could possibly be backing that advocacy more so? Yeah, you could. There's a whole, I mean, you can just go on to the uh, this legislative website and see what's going on with bills. That's that's the part that anybody can do from their own computer. House Bill 193 right now is the bill for voucher system, which has now uh, gone to a finance committee today. Today it did, yeah. Yeah, today it came out of the blue. It wasn't supposed to go to a finance committee, and all of a sudden today it went to a finance committee. That would even take away more uh, money from towns. That, and it's in towns like us that don't have any revenues besides the, the homeowners that are in town. It, it, it I'm sorry. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you to finish what I'm going to talk. To you. I'm waiting. Go ahead. Go ahead. You want to? No, you're not. You're really, really bad. Bad. I see it. Go ahead. I'll no, finish I, after. No, what it is? I had too much coffee. Um, yeah. No, the this the adequacy money 
comes, most of it comes from the state portion of your property tax. So it's not like they're going to give us more money and not take more money. It's, that's not, you know, we already are paying into that. If you look at your tax bill, you'll see there's a town portion, a state portion, and a school portion. The state portion is what funds the adequacy <coughs> money. The, ad the adequacy money is based on how many students you have. So when you're, the money's gone down because our population has gone down, you get like $3,600 per student, okay? Everybody does. And then you have, there's a formula for how many special ed kids you have. So maybe you have, I don't have it in front of me, but it's um, just to say it's $2,000 per special ed student. And then how many children you have who receive free and reduced lunch. You have a certain amount of money you get we don't for that, which we don't have very many. Then the last um, number is how many students you have who did not score in the proficient level in reading in third grade. Okay, so if you have a lot of kids that are doing well reading in third grade, you'll get more money. If your kids are proficient, you don't get as much money. So they take that, they add it together, and then they figure out how much, pro how much money you've already paid for your statewide property tax, and then the difference is what they give back to you. Okay, so if we raise a certain amount, um, let's just say we raise $2 million in our statewide property tax, but we're supposed to be getting $3 million, then they'll give us the difference. And I, I mean, I'm exaggerating, it's not that much. But do you understand? So it's not that we're paying for it one way or another. The money doesn't come from the air, we have to pay. So, you know, it'd be nice, but our population has gone down. And so they're not, we're not getting as much money. But that much from the Homeschoolers, homeschoolers, yes. it's a huge drop. What's the, what, can I just ask what the difference from last year's total population to this year's? Um, I don't have the, I didn't bring all the enrollment money with, uh, enrollment it's numbers not. with me. Yeah. I have, I know the adequacy difference is it's almost $200,000. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm thinking, like, from last year, why our taxes go up by 10%? I get you're talking that it's about student enrollment, but if, did we really go down? Do we really have that many less students that it went, our taxes went up 10%? That seems like, well, it wasn't do you know what I'm It was only 7% of the kids. Mm -hmm. Six or seven? Six, no, six or six seven, seven. Uh, kids <laughs> difference. That, to me, Scott. doesn't equate to 10%. Oh, it's me. Okay. The other Scott. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you. that's part of it, right? Yeah. So you have to look at your student populations in general, OK? So back when I started, your student population in special ed was somewhere around between 70 and 80. Right? So Mrs. Hendrickson right, somewhere between fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars you get for each identified student. Right now you're down to sixty-three. Sixty-three? So you're going to lose that, right? And then if you also look with the attorney the economy, I bet you your free and reduced lunch rate has dropped. So, Right. I'll talk about it all. So you got that, right? Then there's another form of aid called catastrophic aid that basically says to me, if I place a kid outside, just the district, right? After three and a half times the average daily membership tuition in the state, so about 55,000, let's call it, mm -hmm. then I can put in reimbursement for the state at 80% up to 100 thousand, a little more than that, and then from there it's a hundred percent, right? So that's revenue that comes in. But what happens each year, they never have enough money to fund Cat A to the level, so the legislature gets together and like, we'll pay 70 percent of that 80 percent, right? So in that way, the, that revenue stream is there, except the good news is you don't have any out-of-district placements that are catastrophic aid eligible. So it would be sort of a death strategy for budgeting for us to say, let's place a lot of kids and get 60% of it back, right? Mm -hmm. So you've lost that revenue. <laughs> in addition, um, when an identified student is Medicaid eligible, we can bill New Medicaid to New Hampshire schools 50% of the cost of a rehabilitative assistant in the form of paraprofessional for like speech or behavior or not academics. Um, the speech pathologist, the occupational therapist, the school counselor can all bill Medicaid for those services. But if you have a decreased number of kids who are Medicaid eligible, then you're not going to get that revenue. So it's good news, but it's bad news at the same time. 
So you take all those pieces, and Mrs. Henderson just did an amazing job of explaining a pretty complicated formula that's likely to change. I'll follow up on that. But well, you got the other piece of the federal government for, uh, paying spe uh, special education 40 percent, is it? Or is it still 40? Not even. It's not good for three districts. Judge Gregg was the last one that, that challenged yeah. the federal government on so getting you, a, a you higher had, amount. You had right. some downshifting, but yeah. even more interesting is that, so each year, I, like, I'll let you know in five years, I probably reduced a lot of money in special education just because you're declining population, trying to be efficient, even tonight, trying to get the OTs to supervise the quota, mm -hmm. to try to make sure there's a bigger piece of pie for the general act, right? Mm -hmm. So, in, 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 I'll be honest, when I started, I didn't know, so I just followed budgeting and then made reductions and reductions and reductions. So, over the past three or four years, at the end of the year, out of the fund balance that's left, that's offset property taxes, right? Mm -hmm. But as we get tighter with budgeting, and this goes for all of us after we've been here for a period of time, your fund balance is going to be less, right? Because we've gotten more proficient at budgeting more tightly. So if you take all those things and combine them, you're sort of in, and then with those increases, like a transportation contract that came with one bid that went up X number of percent, mm -hmm. and, 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 and different things. You take that, you've got sort of a perfect storm. I think the overall budget's only up. Right. It's up 100, like, no, the percentage wise, it's oh, only up. Oh, it's 1.9%. Yeah, it's up 1.9%, yeah. but then if you look at the corresponding tax rate increase, it's something like. 10%. Right. Because you don't have those offsetting revenues that you've had, which are, in a lot of ways, some of those are like good news revenues, right? We don't have this. We don't need it. We don't have to. So that it's it's you know it's like a double-edged sword. Um, I will tell you that Representative Ladd last week at the two weeks ago at the um, legislative priorities workshop where we do advocate for money. Um, has pointed out that declining enrollments have caused an upswell from the smaller towns, and they're going to take a look at the way they do advocacy. Yeah, I read that. So it may not be a per pupil kind of thing anymore. It might be here you go, because there's been such declining revenue. Scott, what about homeschool schools? Well, that's Senate Bill 193. And Senate Bill 193 went through a major amendment yesterday, or the day before. But it's today. No. I'll tell you what the finance. No. Okay. They went to finance. Okay. So, and I'm not totally up to date, I was on vacation um, until today, but I can tell you that Senate Bill 193 used to be 300% of the poverty level, now it's 185%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, um, they're looking to fund it in a different way that I'm not totally clear on yet. Um, and the eligible students, you have to have kindergarten and first grade. You have to be right. already been enrolled in yeah. a public school for yeah. kindergarten and first grade. The pri private so, schools have to be accredited right. by so the third party. The, the um, pool of eligible students based on those amendments has, has <coughs> yeah. So whether you're charter, home, or non-public, mm -hmm. that'll be a little different. But I want to point out, like, you know that CAD invoice that we just mm -hmm. paid? That $3,000 is a good deal, except you don't have the adequacy money that was attached to that either. So now you're up to six, seven, eight, nine. You know, you've got to keep in line that when a student's not in your ADM, you don't get that, that funding. It, ultimately, when you look at what you pay for tuition at Cole Brown, it seems like a better deal, but you've lost. You see, you get the adequacy money for the students at Cole Brown. That's, that's your money. And I think it's also important for people to remember that, that in some districts, we split it by elementary and high school, mm -hmm. and that makes for a really transparent piece mm -hmm. to see your costs that you don't have any control over, mm -hmm. which are your high school costs, as opposed to your K-8 costs. I already so. wrote that down. I'm going to see if I can work on that. See, look, we're thinking the, the same thing. So, there's, I know I took a lot of public comment, but there's okay. lots of different factors. It's a good explanation. Can I piggyback off of that just you can for do like a minute? Not mm -hmm. even? Yeah. So, I have a history in front of me here from um, what I have previously estimated the tax impact to be compared to what the actuals have come in at. Mm -hmm. um, just so everybody knows. So, 
My estimated tax rate is kind of like your worst case scenario because I don't know at the end of the year what we are actually going to receive for revenue. I don't know how much we're going to um, return to the town for the surplus at the end of the year. I can come up with an estimate, but I, you know, I don't know what's going to break or not break before the end of the year. Um, and with all of that stuff, and typically our do not exceed rates from our health insurance company, typically those come in significantly less as well. And then you have people changing their plans during the year from, you know, going from a family to a single and, you know, whatever. Um, so in 2014, the estimated tax rate was 19.26, and the actual tax rate came in at 18.1. Okay? So your actual tax rate in 2014 was $18. It significantly went down to 1665, which I think is what you're currently at, because over those one, two, three, four years, we've returned and we've returned 200,000, almost 800,000 dollars in 2016. So in 2018, the estimated tax rate that I came up with is 18.25, which is 15 cents higher than your 2014. It, yeah. So what Marjorie is talking about is what we have left in the budget mm -hmm. at the yeah. end of the year we could turn down. No, that's why we were going through the financials mm -hmm. earlier. And we don't have a lot left right now. That's because what we're talking about. Because we're tighter on the yeah. budgeting, we're, like Scott mm -hmm. was just talking yeah. about. Right. So, so we're not going to be able to return $400,000 yeah. like we have in the past. And one year we had a lot of money back from the health trust. Yeah. And we returned a lot of money that year to <coughs> offset the taxes. Mm -hmm. Some people, a lot of you probably got a tax decrease that year. Oh, yeah. um, so this year, looking at our budget, we don't know. We may be able to get back $100,000, but so early, we don't know. We don't have that much left at this time of, the, of our budget. The reality is everything's cyclic. Right now, we're in a down cycle. The town grew. We brought in a lot of people, a lot of families came here, and we raised a lot of kids in this town. Those kids can't afford to buy into this town right now. They're not raising their families here. Housing is too costly. I'm a builder. It's too much money to buy a piece of land to start with. I mean, if you drive around town, there is some building going on in town. But a lot of that building may not even bring kids to town. Those two houses that are being built right on the lakefront, by the time you're old enough to afford to buy that piece of land, build that house, you've probably already raised your kids. I don't know those particular situations. But we're at a point right now, we're in a cycle. We've had, we, we have, we have wants and we have needs. And we've been fulfilling wants and wants and wants and wants. And we're at a point right now in this town, and I'm running my campaign on this, that we've got to take some of the wants away. And it's going to be painful for a little while. And I don't think it's going to be permanent. I personally believe that the population will come back. I think it will keep going down right now, as Kerry has stated. You know, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing a, a large group that are still exiting in the 7th and 8th grades. And that's going to happen. And it'll take a while before we start to see some of these new homes that are going to go in over mm -hmm. on um, uh, Second Crown Point. You know, and those are, those are going to be introductory style homes that maybe some young people can afford to live in. There's been, I'm, I'm, I'm on the planning board, there's some stuff that's happening statewide with additional dwelling units on properties to, uh, to allow people to have their kids maybe take over the house and you build an apartment and as, as parents you move into the apartment above the garage that you might have had for your kids when they went to college and then they take over taking care of the grass and everything else. Those things are happening, and that will that will allow more students to be into our population. But right now, we're in that spot. We've got to look at classroom sizes. I know everybody talks about 12 to 14 in the class. That's wonderful if we can afford it. My tax bill is going to go up from $10,000 to $11,000 this year. Oh, yeah. we're That's $1,000. That's three days of putting siding on a building that I have to do to give to the town but it's I'm actually the same rate it was in 2016. What's that? But it's actually the same rate as it was in 2016. It, so if you talk about cycles, you got we all got a good year last year. We we actually because of the returns, just as you were saying, we just didn't see the increases to go from the 10 percent. We didn't go to six, eight, ten. We kind of laid and jumped. So that's what we're paying for. But the reality is, there's room 
there's room to increase classroom sizes. You don't have to have 12 kids in a classroom. You don't have to have 14. We don't have I don't any want, we don't I don't want any, that. We, we don't I, have any 12 kids. I know, we, we have. We have. We have. No, we don't know. We have. And I paid for that, and it was okay. I have a son that went to school and got a great education here. And that's okay. And we can afford, my wife and I can afford. We do okay. So it's not about me. I'm thinking of my in-laws that, that are at retirement in their 70s now, that don't work anymore. There's a lot of those people, I have a lot of friends that I've lost out of this community, that I've known for a long time that they retired and they can't stay here. That's what I worry about. So it's going to come back, I think it'll come back, but for right now, there's going to be a time where it's going to, you're going to have to go to 18 kids in the classroom. Maybe 20 in older grades. There are. There's going to be we're in. Okay. Okay. We're going to do a... Okay. The seventh grade in kindergarten are at 22. Exactly. Right. Everybody else is up at 20. Mm -hmm. Everybody else under yeah. 20. 18, 19, but no 14, right. 12. Right. I mean, it's, be right. well, it's, just the, it's just the way it is. Yeah. Like, yeah. It is like yeah. a million. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Uh, a million? Yes. Did you get... Did. Okay. Uh, Mindy, Gladier. Yeah. Um, I'd like to build a little bit on what he said. Scott brought up and Katie raised some points about transparency and particularly the way that the board presented the budget to the um, budget district meeting. So just to bring that point back because we started, started there and we cycled off. But um, I've followed the budget for many, many years. Um, I haven't been physically at meetings as much this year, so I'm not as tuned into the details, but I have followed the minutes and know that we are in a, a very lean budget much more as we've discussed we've had surpluses and we've trimmed that budget but I believe that this is one of the first years that the board has presented a budget at the district meeting and from my understanding because I wasn't there from I had a work commitment but that there wasn't a lot of pushback because people get the understanding that we've also discussed here as where the money has come from and where the money is gone and I think the reaction from the administration, the teachers, and the public that I know is the fact that after that, the board then went and cut something that was presented and seemed to be understood by the community and supported. And by doing that, I think we've really shot ourselves in the foot to create any flexibility for admi administration. I've been to the meetings where people come and cut $100,000, and it's I've sat in those meetings and made phone calls to get people to come and support our cause. Mm -hmm. So I know that that risk is real, but we've now eliminated any <coughs> possibility in that budget. If we didn't need, we need the guidance position, but as you said, it's not tied to a position. If that $100,000 gets cut now, we are cutting people. If $20,000 gets cut, we're cutting people. We've also, let me speak because I do follow the budget and I know what I'm talking about. You've also already eliminated the fifth grade position down, you know, to a position that is much less than could have been budgeted and was budgeted in the of past. Course. Of course we did. Mm -hmm. So that the budget is an, as thin now put an as it in could possibly be. The fifth grade I know what you did. Okay. I've read the minutes. Right. So my point That's is brilliant. there is no flexibility in that budget now to add a paraprofessional, to add a guidance position if things are additionally cut. So we have trimmed it to a point that could be very prohibitive that we will have class sizes of 23 in other grades than just what is existing now, or possibly in the lower grades. I, I just want to say we did leave over $110,000 in the budget for a fifth grade position plus <laughs> benefits which the numbers really, that's, we did sort of pad the budget and with that, that position. position. It, that position, still some people still wanted there. to take that position out. We left it so in. So when you say that, you know, there's nothing in because the budget. Because you didn't want to add a first grade position that okay. you already know you have to wait. Let me just, I, I guess, I, I, let me I just get that. that. But that money is, so that's what I'm saying. Okay. You've already trimmed it. That's my point. No, no we, we left the fifth grade position in, which may not be needed. So what I was trying to say to you, when we made that decision about the guidance counselor, I personally knew that we had $110,000 in that budget that if we wanted to get a full-time para for first grade and more guidance, we could do that if we needed to. If we wanted to use it for another grade that needed larger, have larger numbers, we could move that to. We all knew that. So 
we talked about that at that meeting, and I, I guess that's, you know, I guess that's the difference of people are just, you know, maybe not here. No, the minutes don't I, capture, I would, unfortunately, the minutes don't capture better. anything, don't capture everything. I mean, Amelia does a great job, but they don't capture so the entire conversation. What are you going to do in fifth grade then? Because we've now vacated two science positions in the past three years. We lost a seventh, eighth grade position two years ago, mm -hmm. and now we're losing another science position. And if you're saying that that's not going to be filled, that's two science positions out of. I didn't say it wasn't going to be filled. I said we left it in the budget. But then you it's just said it would be used decisions. for first grade. So what's going to happen to first grade? We don't grade? know where we're going to where. I mean, we, we left it as a fifth that's, grade that's position. what I'm supporting, Debbie, is that you don't know, and you can't have all the answers. We can't. But right now, we've trimmed it so that there's very little flexibility. And by further removing $20,000 after a budget was presented at the district meeting, mm -hmm. that was, from my understanding, well received by the community because it was well presented with the numbers that Marjorie and Scott and all of you have in all these text discussions that we just had. People understand and the community is supportive of that and then the perception and the way it's done after the fact by the board seems very reactionary. Mm -hmm. But you guys have a petition warrant article mm -hmm. so let's leave it to the town. I mean, just, yeah, it's part of no, okay. If that's how you want to do business, then you can no, no, support I, I, your cause that well, way. There was two of them, actually. Okay. Um, I, and I think that should send a message to the board, then, that the people supported it, and that the board should have followed the community's lead, or not require the community to, to See, tell you that. I, I guess when I was at the meeting, I heard people asking um, if we could leave the SAU because the cost was too high. I heard I'm people ready. talking about, mm -hmm. oh, like I, it, I heard ready. a lot of questions about what we could do to cut things. They were asking about the, the special ed preschool. So there wasn't, I heard questions and concerns about where we could take, what and we I could do to bring our budget down. I responsibility to answer those, and you guys usually have very good answers right. to those so, things. Yeah. Do you have any questions now for the boys? It's getting into a dialogue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cindy Yale. Yeah. Um, thanks. I would like to know what was last year's um, budget for the bus? You, how often do you get the contracts? We just did a three year contract, which we just signed um, two months or what was it? The end of December? Yeah. End of December. We just um, and signed it went up a three 70, year contract. Did you say it went up $70,000? $70,000 for this year. Did they, Next year will be another 3%. Did they justify why it went up that much? But Cindy, we put out bids to every bus company. Mm -hmm. We received one bid. One bid, very territorial. So it's been yeah. Yeah. They no, will, no, nobody's going into anybody else's territory right now. They're yeah. waiting. I'm just wondering why it's so much, why the increase is so much. Do they, they say they need a new buses? They New buses? We're held hostage. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. so you can't we don't want to be in a situation like that. Scott, you got an answer for this one? <gasps> overpaid bus drivers. <laughs> huh? I like overpaid bus drivers. Yeah. I don't think that's no, it. I'm just joking. <laughs> I get 25 cents a year. I've been here for 25 years. No, you should go to them and I'll ask I, them why you're not getting more. Scott, go ahead, chime in. I can tell you that in another district who uses Dale, we had these discussions and um, it was conveyed to us that. Um, There'll be some pay increases to retain drivers because yeah, uh, yeah. they're having a hard time <laughs> filling those positions. Um, <coughs> and that was the predominant increase right there. Sign on. And, and we were so actually feeling lucky positions. this year that we didn't have Northwood transportation mm -hmm. end up yeah. like the Northwood school having mm -hmm. to right. adjust their Well, schedule. I didn't know if any of those costs were like taken, like, our increase was so much because we had to help them with their stuff because no. all the the no. sign on bonuses and all that stuff we get none of that. No. Just saying, you no, know. Actually, somebody's getting it. You're not getting it. Right. No. I do want to speak to that though for a second because um, so Dale they, they do they did say that they would come up with fifteen hundred dollars um, for a sign on bonus and I think that's a new thing that they, a new tactic they were trying to use this mm -hmm. year to get it. Yeah. Um, but the other school district um, did vote to give up to $4,500, so that was one of the things. But that school district paid that amount of money not coming not Dale. from Dale. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so that, I just want to be clear, that had nothing to do okay. with that company. 
Well, I just thought it was such a significant increase. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. significant. Yeah. One of the other towns that we just redid yeah. with Dale, it was I significant know, right? for them, too. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else for public session? I have, real quick, I'm, I don't want to be a dead horse, but I, I want to make sure I'm at least saying what you want me to say. Oh, I just wanted to say, <laughs> <one>. to say. <laughs> um, a lot of uh, what I'm going to wanted to say has already been said, so I don't want to repeat it. Um, but with regard to um, the part-time counselor position, um, I think Brian said it best, um, and I haven't quoted. It's a small percentage of our overall budget, and it really directly affects students. Um, if this were $250,000 we were talking about, I'd get the hesitation. We're talking about $10 annually for a $250,000 house. Guys, this reflects. This affects every single one of our students. It's such a small amount for such a big impact, and so I don't see where that um, that cut made much sense. And so, um, obviously, as you guys know, we did the petition warrant article. Um, I worked with Erica and Jim, and um, I think it says a lot that two people from different sides, might we say, Jim, can we agree to that, <laughs> that we've come together on this issue because we feel that strongly about it. Um, and I hope that the, um, that the community will share our position and that they will support um, Dr. Young and um, Mrs. Pepnot in their request. Um, in addition to that, um, as for the AP position, um, I commend you guys for looking at ways to cut costs and to reduce taxes, and I'm grateful for that open dialogue. Um, but you continue to bring up this position. I wonder, kind of going to what uh, Katie was saying, have any of you, and, and what was your word you used for the um, being inquisitive or to curiosity. ask curiosity? curiosity? Love that word. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if any of you guys have asked what the AP brings to the school. Because um, I spoke with teachers. Um, I spoke with paras. I spoke with the AP herself. And I asked what she brings to the school. Um, the answer from everybody was a sense of calm, a sense of order that was been, that's been missing from Stratford School for many years. From what I've been told, the way she deals with children is incredible. With a behavioral background, she looks to the root of the behavior, not the behavior itself. She helps teachers and parents by excelling at their jobs so they can do theirs. She works closely with Mrs. Pagnotta to bring effective programs to the school. She and Dr. Dr. Young complement each other. They work together to provide leadership and a shared vision for our school community. There's no way that this school could run effectively without the addition of an assistant principal, let alone somebody like Mrs. Valorian. Um, and I encourage each of you to continue to ask the same questions before next year's budget season. Um, we're doing our kids a huge disservice by making decisions based solely on suggestions, the state suggestion of um, um, enrollment suggestions. You know that we can't just base it on that one suggestion because it's not. It's just that it's a suggestion. It's not a requirement. Um, and it's a starting point, a point from which I hope any elected board member would use to provoke questions and determine what is right for Stratford School. Thank you. Cindy. I agree. Thank you. That was really good. <laughs> I love having Mrs. Bagarian here. She is incredible. You can go talk with her about any issues you have with the kids, and she'll get right down to the point. She'll get, she'll get it done. Um, my other thing is um, working... I'm mostly in fourth grade. I have a granddaughter in first grade in her classroom. There's 19 kids. Um, she was thriving when she moved into this town, and not so much now. She's having a little bit of a hard time because there are so many kids in her classroom, and I'm passionate about it. Sorry. How many um, kids? Can you say that again for me? How many kids? How many kids in the first grade? 19 in each classroom. And how many in the fourth grade? I'm not sure how many. Well, I think she's trying to get a point. I am trying to get a point. Um, it's very. The younger grades need more help. I agree. They need another teacher. Each one of them. Kindergarten and first. And I'm not sure why I'm getting so upset about it. It's okay. <laughs> um, I've worked in kindergarten. I've worked in first. And the smaller class sizes. Are so much better. Thank you. I agree. I think one through four, mm -hmm. and that's where we should try to keep them as small as possible. Yeah. Right now they're 22 and 23, and I think the um, general ed pair, and 22, yeah. the general ed para comment from the last meeting about there being um, that that's a great idea. We should just add another general ed para. 
that's not small class sizes. That's not the same. Not even close, guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yes, a general ed pair is, is a good, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's, you're still at 22, 23 kids, and you know we're going to get more kindergarten, uh, first graders next year. Kindergarten mm -hmm. isn't, isn't mandatory. I guarantee mm -hmm. those numbers go up. 21, 22 is just not possible next year with a general ed pair that will be split between the two classrooms. Right. Mm -hmm. It's okay. just not possible. And with, with so many kids coming in, a lot of the stuff that people in the community don't see are the behaviors. The behaviors are incredible. And um, some of the kids that are really good compared to some of the kids that are not so good, it's all the, all the uh, attention's going to the other kid. Like, you know, Johnny's not doing what he needs to be doing. This child over here is doing what they need to be doing, but they're losing the teacher because it's just crazy. I invite you to come in and see. Mm -hmm. Come to a lunch. Come to first grade and sit. Come to kindergarten and see how they play are. It's crazy. <laughs> just so to, thank you. Just yeah, to build I, I know. It, I just wanted to say, too, because I think that, you know, there's classroom management can always be a challenge, certainly with younger kids having the 20, 21, and 22 creates even greater challenge because of self-regulation issues. But there's also the emerging issue that's here, it's not just here at Stratford, it's at many, many, many schools around school readiness, obviously for young children coming into schools and what you can expect they're able to do from a self-regulation standpoint. If you want to just, you know, executive functioning, there's, there's a reason why there's been focus on that issue for the last almost 10 years. That's, was, that's what I focused my dissertation on. So um, I don't want, I, I think, in other words, I think that it, it's, there's a part of this conversation that's not just about Stratford or Stratford kiddos. There's a part of this that really is a larger issue. Um, and it does create a different kind of management mm -hmm. situation. From a classroom management perspective, it creates um, the, the, the situation, the kinds of management tactics or techniques and things that you would typically employ or be able to do even with younger children can be effective, but their effect is, effectiveness is becoming less and less impactful because, in part, of school readiness concerns. So, again, we don't have a magic solution to that issue, but I think that that's, from a wider lens, there's, we, as, as many schools are, are experiencing the, uh, how to figure that piece out. Now, Scott, do you feel that the full day kindergarten has helped with the school readiness? For first graders, I think it invariably will, will help. It inevitably does. It inevitably does. Mm -hmm. But again, you do have some challenges mm -hmm. in those for our kiddos in those classrooms that go that that are not simply school readiness <coughs> challenges that are 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 bigger are, are larger challenges than simply school readiness. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, I think it, it it inevitably helps. Yes, I don't know if it's the I don't know if it, it's the the uh, thing that cures every ail, so to speak, mm -hmm. with that piece, but sure it helps. Okay. Anything else for a public Would session? You, sorry, just a quick question. Marjorie, you had said uh, math is, I'm still working on that piece, it's not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> it's um, okay. So you had said that, that right now that you expect that the budget would go up 14 cents. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because what you were saying, I felt like, would be helpful for the town to understand at the meeting that the difference between what has been projected and what's in actuality has happened historically. Can you expand on that a little bit more? And then secondly, can, can, that, can that be presented as a part of the discussion um, at the town meeting? It's Absolutely. actually... Um, it's on the Warren article. Yeah, it's on the Warren article. That's on the Warren article. The history piece, I think, is what you're talking about. That is in the, um, we prepare the pamphlets for that day. Um, that it should have been in the hearing packet that they had done. Okay. And it is presented in the new packet. Okay. Um, I had to update it because of the decrease of the $20,000, so that mm -hmm. did affect something. So yeah. um, I had to update it, so that will be updated in the new packet. Okay. Um, and I think what you're referring to, uh, Katie, is that the actual tax rate in 2014 was 1810, and for 2018, between the past four years, 
since then we've returned uh, 8, 12, 14, about $2 million to the town in the past two years. So that's why the taxes have either decreased or not increased by much. So um, you're looking at a 15 cent increase between what I'm projecting this year, which I'm assuming between the amount that we'll return back to the town will be less yeah. compared to the 1810 that the actual rate was in 2004. And during that, that time, we, we have reevaluation too. Mm -hmm. right. that, re -evaluation that, that's a really changes. good point, though, to bring forward mm -hmm. to show that it's not just a big 10% increase. Right. That you know it was those decreases and decrease or not or those returns, mm -hmm. so that so that, that so that people don't <laughs> look at it and go, wow, 10 percent. Where's this going? Right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. I think that would make it clearer. Sure. And Bruce's point, um, like like we like we we've been saying all night. There's there's all these things that change that we don't know what they're going to be. We don't know how much returning to the town. We don't know what our revenue is going to be for next year. We don't know what the um, house costs are actually going to come in at. Um, and Bruce just mentioned, like, the biggest part is that the net assessed evaluation, that changes every year. Mm -hmm. um, if your net assessed valuation goes down in your town, the property value decreases, you got to raise that same amount of money in that town. So inevitably, you're going to see it go up. But if it goes up, say you have 100 complexes that are going to be filled all of a sudden, it will increase. So it divvies it up between the entire well, it does, so but it also, it also adds student population, which costs money. Right, exactly. So there's not always a gain there. Right. Reevaluation is your best friend, because then your neighbor's finished basement gets found. Yeah. Right. Well, you all finished basement. Yeah. It's, it's true. true. No, it's true. It's good for It's good I mean, you. You don't think you get it. And the, to the, the town has gone, and the town has gone to a full-time assessor. Right. Now. It used to be assessment every 10 years. Now there's a full-time one that goes around. It's cycling. Yeah, cycling, yeah. Right. So, I'm sorry, is there anything else for public no, session? No, we need to go your your yeah. comments have not been taken like this. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you very much for coming. Nice to see people see here. See you guys later. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you stand behind the screen that Jim provides. <laughs> we, we need to go into a non-public really session. session. Right. Everything right. 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 And I do know where you're coming from. Thanks. Bruce, I'm looking for the heads up for you to... I'm deaf. Lindsay and I have Just let me know. Yeah, we're done. We'll be done. Oh, okay. so we're going to go on public. I'll we'll take you on. I'm sorry. I'm just waiting for you to go non public. <laughs> oh, to, to vote. Oh, I need a motion for non public. Sorry. Because I thought I'm sitting here waiting for you to vote. All right. Um, okay. 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 Well, maybe we need that recorder at least. Well, what do you think? By like statute, those are the clerk's minutes. Okay. So you have, like, if you think about it, the clerk writes the minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's like a public hearing. Yeah, but that's like the 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 public hearing. So I was saying if we had a backup recording system or something, the recorder wasn't yeah. working. We had no minutes from last year. Well, that's an issue. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. Should we get bring at least a little tape recorder to add for at least this the board? This was really rough listening to when you guys were doing the meeting in the in the cafeteria. Okay, there's a lot of that. I we know. should we should be. Perfect. Can you test that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We'll definitely test it. But I really, the, the sound equipment that's in there now, can it record? Yeah. Perfect. All right. All right. I mean, it's basically digital. So it, we shouldn't have any problems, but we'll. we'll so this is it. new from, we got this after last year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Last year was all in the set tape. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Anything else for public session? Copy. The meeting today in the morning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I won't be saying much. I don't think so. <laughs> Make a motion to vote. Jerms. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we out? What the arrows?